section thirty five of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter thirty by six o'clock in the morning miss prissy came out of the best room to the breakfast-table with the air of a general who has arranged a campaign her face glowing with satisfaction all sat down together to their morning meal the outside door was open into the green turfy yard and the apple-tree now nursing stores of fine yellow jennetings looked in at the window every once in a while as a breeze shook the leaves a fully ripe apple might be heard falling to the ground at which miss prissy would bustle up from the table and rush to secure the treasure as the meal waxed to its close the rattling of wheels was heard at the gate and candace was discerned seated aloft in the one-horse wagon with her usual complements of baskets and bags well now dear me if there is not candace said miss prissy i do believe mrs marvyn has sent her with something for the quilting and out she flew as nimble as a humming-bird while those in the house heard various exclamations of admiration as candace with stately dignity disinterred from the wagon one basket after another and exhibited to miss prissy's enraptured eyes sly peeps under the white napkins by which they were covered and then lodging a large basket on either arm she rolled majestically towards the house like a heavy-laden indiaman coming in after a fat voyage good morning mrs scudder good morning doctor she said dropping her curtsey on the doorstep good morning miss mary you see our folks were stirring pretty early this morning and mrs marvyn sent me down with two or three little things setting down her baskets on the floor and seating herself between them she proceeded to develop their contents with ill-concealed triumph one basket was devoted to cakes of every species from the great mont blanc loaf cake with its snowy glaciers of frosting to the twisted cruller and puffy doughnut in the other basket lay pots of golden butter curiously stamped reposing on a bed of fresh green leaves while currants red and white and delicious cherries and raspberries gave a final finish to the picture from a basket which miss prissy brought in from the rear appeared cold fowl and tongue delicately prepared and shaded with feathers of parsley candace whose rollicking delight in the good things of this life was conspicuous in every emotion might have furnished to a painter as she sat in a brilliant turban an idea for an african genius of plenty well really candace said mrs scudder you are overwhelming us ho 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 said candace i's tellin miss marvin folks don't get married but once in their lives generally speakin that is and then they ought to have plenty to do it with well i must say said miss prissy taking out the loaf cake with busy assiduity i must say candace this does beat all i should rather think it ought said candace bridling herself with proud consciousness if it don't it ain't cause old candace hain't put enough into it i tell you i didn't do nothin all day yesterday but just make dat ar cake cato when he got up he begun to talk something about his shirt buttons and i just shed him right up says i cato when i's really got cake to make for a great cajun i want my mind just as quiet and just as serene as if i was a-goin to the meetin i don't want no earthly cares on it now says i cato the old doctor's goin to be married and dis year is his quiltin cake and miss mary she's goin to be married and dis year is her quiltin cake and dere'll be everybody to dat ere quiltin and if de cake ain't right white right, twould be puttin a candle under a bushel and so says i cato your buttons must wait and cato he sees the priority of it cause though he can't make cake like me he's a amazing good judge of it and is dreadful tickled when i slip out a little loaf for his supper 
how is mrs marvyn said mrs scudder kinder thin and shimmery but she is bout havin her eyes everywhere and lookin into everything she just touches things with the tips of her fingers and they seem to go like she'll be down to the quiltin this afternoon but she told me to take the things and come down and spend the day here for mrs marvyn and i both knows how many steps must be taken such times and we agreed you ought to favour yourselves all you could well now said miss prissy lifting up her hands if that ain't what tis to have friends why that was one of the things i was thinking of as i lay awake last night because you know at times like these people run their feet off before the time begins and then they are all limpsy and lopsided when the time comes now i say candace all mrs scudder and mary have to do is to give everything up to us and we'll put it through straight that's what we will said candace just show me what's to be done and i'll do it candace and miss prissy soon disappeared together into the pantry with the baskets whose contents they began busily to arrange candace shut the door that no sound might escape and began a confidential outpouring to miss prissy you see she said i has feelin's all the while for miss marvyn cause you see she was expectin if ever mary was married well that would be to somebody else you know miss prissy responded with a sympathetic groan well said candace if it had been anybody but the doctor i would not have been resigned but after all he has done for my colour there ain't nothing i could find it in my heart to grudge him but then i was telling cato the other day says i cato i don't know about the rest of the world but i hain't never felt it in my bones that master james is really dead for sartin now i feels things generally but some things i feels in my bones and them always comes true and that r is a feelin i han't had about master jim yet and that r is what i'm waitin for for i clear make up my mind though i know cordin to all white folks way o thinkin there ain't no hope cause squire marvin he had that jaluth pettibone up to his house question him on him off and on nigh about three hours and really i didn't see no hope no way except just this as i was tellin cato i can't feel it in my bones candace was not versed enough in the wisdom of the world to know that she belonged to a large and respectable school of philosophers in this particular mode of testing evidence which after all the reader will perceive has its conveniences another thing said candace as much as a dozen times this year last year when i have been a scourin knives a fork has fell and stuck straight up in the floor and the last time i pinted it out to miss marvin and she only just said why what of that candace well said miss prissy i don't believe in signs but then strange things do happen now about dogs howling under windows why i don't believe in it a bit but i never knew it fail that there was a death in the house after i, I tell you what said candace looking mysterious dogs knows a heap more than they likes to tell just so said miss prissy now i remember one night when i was watching with miss colonel andrews after martha ann was born that we heard the mournfullest howling that ever you did hear it seemed to come from right under the front stoop and miss andrews she just dropped the spoon in her gruel and says she miss prissy do for pity's sake just go down and see what that noise is and i went down and lifted up one of the loose boards of the stoop and what should i see there but their newfoundland pup there that creature had dug a grave and was a-sittin by it crying candace drew near to miss prissy dark with expressive interest as her voice in this awful narration sank to a whisper well said candace after miss prissy had made something of a pause well i told miss andrews i didn't think there was anything in it said miss prissy but she added impressively she lost a very dear brother six months after and i laid him out with my own hands yes laid him out in white flannel some folks say said candace that dreaming about white horses is a certain sign jinny styles is very strong about that now she came down one morning crying cause she had been dreaming about white horses and she was sure she should here some friend was dead and sure enough a man came in that day and told her that her son was drowned out in the harbour and jenny said there she was sure that sign never would fail but then you see that night he came home jenny wasn't really disappointed but she always insisted he was as good as drowned anyway cause he sank three times well i tell you said miss prissy there are a great many more things in this world than folks know about 
so they are said candace now i hain't never opened my mind to nobody but there's a dream i've had three mornings running lately i dreamed i see jim marvin a sinking in the water and stretching up his hands and then i dreamed that i see the lord jesus come a-walking on the water and take a hold of his hand and says he o oh, thou of little faith wherefore didst thou doubt and then he lifted him right out and i hain't said nothing to nobody cause you know the doctor he says people must not mind nothing about their dreams cause dreams belong to the old spensation well 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 said miss prissy i'm sure i don't know what to think what time in the morning was it that you dreamed it why said candace it was just after bird peep i kind of always wakes myself then and turns over and what comes after that is apt to run clear well 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 said miss prissy i don't know what to think you see it may have reference to the state of his soul i know that said candace but as nigh as i could judge in my dream she added sinking her voice and looking mysterious as nigh as i can judge that boy's soul was in his body why how do you know said miss prissy looking astonished at the confidence with which candace expressed her opinion well you see said candace rather mysteriously the doctor he don't like to have us talk much about these things cause he thinks it's kind of heathenish but then folks as is used to seeing such things knows the look of a spirit out of the body from the look of a spirit in the body just as easy as you can tell mary from the doctor at this moment mrs scudder opened the pantry door and put an end to this mysterious conversation which had already so affected miss prissy that in the eagerness of her interest she had rubbed up her cap border and ribbon into rather an elfin and goblin style as if they had been ruffled up by a breeze from the land of spirits and she flew around for a few moments in a state of great nervous agitation upsetting dishes knocking down plates and huddling up contrary suggestions as to what ought to be done first in such impossible relations that mrs katie scudder stood in dignified surprise at this strange freak of conduct in the wise woman of the parish a dim consciousness of something not quite canny in herself appeared to strike her for she made a vigorous effort to appear composed and facing mrs scudder with an air of dignified suavity inquired if it would not be best to put jim marvin in the oven now while candace was getting the pies ready meaning of course a large turkey which was to be the first in an indefinite series to be baked that morning and discovering by mrs scudder's dazed expression and a vigorous pinch from candace that somehow she had not improved matters Matters. she rubbed her spectacles in a diagonal manner across her eyes and stood glaring through them with a helpless expression which in a less judicious person might have suggested the idea of a state of slight intoxication but the exigencies of an immediate temporal dispensation put an end to miss prissy's unwanted vagaries and she was soon to be seen flying round like a meteor dusting shaking curtains counting napkins wiping and sorting china all with such rapidity as to give rise to the idea that she actually existed in forty places at once candace whom the limits of her corporeal frame restricted to an altogether different style of locomotion often rolled the whites of her eyes after her and gave vent to her views of her proceedings in sententious expressions do you know why dat ar never was married she said to mary as she stood looking after her miss prissy had made one of those rapid transits through the apartment no answered mary innocently why was not she because never was a man could run fast enough to catch her said candace and then her portly person shook with the impulse of her own wit by two o'clock a goodly company began to assemble mrs deacon twitchell arrived soft pillowy and plaintive as ever accompanied by serinthy ann a comely damsel tall and trim with a bright black eye and a most vigorous and determined style of movement good mrs jones broad expansive and solid having vegetated tranquilly on in the cabbage garden of the virtues since three years ago when she graced our tea-party was now as well preserved as ever and brought some fresh butter a tin pail of cream and a loaf of cake made on a new philadelphia receipt the tall spare angular figure of mrs simeon brown only was wanting but she patronized mrs scudder no more and tossed her head with a becoming pride when her name was mentioned 
the quilt pattern was gloriously drawn in oak leaves done in indigo and soon all the company young and old were passing busy fingers over it and conversation went on briskly madame de frontignac we must not forget to say had entered with hearty abandon into the spirit of the day she had dressed the tall china vases on the mantelpieces and departing from the usual rule of an equal mixture of roses and asparagus bushes had constructed two quaint and graceful bouquets where garden flowers were mingled with drooping grasses and trailing wild vines forming a graceful combination which excited the surprise of all who saw it it's the very first time in my life that i ever saw grass put into a flower-pot said miss prissy but i must say it looks as handsome as a picture mary i must say she added in an aside i think that madame de frongenac is the sweetest dressing and appearing creature i ever saw she don't dress up nor put on airs but she seems to see in a minute how things ought to go and if it's only a bit of grass or leaf or wild vine that she puts in her hair why it seems to come just right i should like to make her a dress for i know she would understand my fit do speak to her mary in case she should want a dress fitted here to let me try it at the quilting madame de frontignac would have her seat and soon won the respect of the party by the dexterity with which she used her needle though when it was whispered that she learned to quilt among the nuns some of the elderly ladies exhibited a slight uneasiness as being rather doubtful whether they might not be encouraging papistical opinions by allowing her an equal share in the work of getting up their minister's bed quilt but the younger part of the company were quite captivated by her foreign air and the pretty manner in which she lisped her english and cerinthy ann even went so far as to horrify her mother by saying that she wished she had been educated in a convent herself a declaration which arose less from native depravity than from a certain vigorous disposition which often shows itself in young people to shock the current opinions of their elders and betters of course the conversation took a general turn somewhat in unison with the spirit of the occasion and whenever it flagged some allusion to a forthcoming wedding or some sly hint to the future young madam of the parish was sufficient to awake the dormant animation of the company cerinthy ann contrived to produce an agreeable electric shock by declaring that for her part she never could see into it how any girl could marry a minister that she should as soon think of setting up housekeeping in a meeting-house oh cerinthy ann exclaimed her mother how can you go on so it's a fact said the adventurous damsel now other men let you have some peace but a minister's always round under your feet so you think the less you see of a husband the better said one of the ladies just my views said cerinthy giving a decided snip to her thread with her scissors i like the nantucketers that go off on four years voyages and leave their wives a clear field if ever i get married i am going up to have one of those fellows it is to be remarked in passing that miss cerinthy ann was at this very time receiving surreptitious visits from a consumptive-looking conscientious young theological candidate who came occasionally to preach in the vicinity and put up at the house of the deacon her father this good young man being violently attacked on the doctrine of election by miss cerinthy had been drawn on to illustrate it in a most practical manner to her comprehension and it was the consciousness of the weak and tottering state of the internal garrison that added vigour to the young lady's tones as mary had been the chosen confidant of the progress of this affair she was quietly amused at the demonstration you'd better take care cerinthy ann said her mother they say that those who sing before breakfast will cry before night girls talk about getting married she said relapsing into a gentle didactic melancholy without realizing its awful responsibilities oh as to that said cerinthy i've been practising on my pudding now these six years and i shouldn't be afraid to throw one up chimney with any girl this speech was founded on a tradition current in those times that no young lady was fit to be married till she could construct a boiled indian pudding of such durability that it could be thrown up chimney and come down on the ground outside without breaking and the consequence of cerinthy ann's sally was a general laugh girls ain't what they used to be in my day sententiously remarked an elderly lady i remember my mother told me when she was thirteen she could knit a long cotton stocking in a day 
i haven't much faith in these stories of old times have you girls said cerinthy appealing to the younger members at the frame at any rate said mrs twitchell our minister's wife will be a pattern i don't know anybody as goes beyond her either in spinning or fine stitching mary sat as placid and disengaged as the new moon and listened to the chatter of old and young with the easy quietness of a young heart that has early outlived life and looks on everything in the world from some gentle restful eminence far on towards a better home she smiled at everybody's word had a quick eye for everybody's wants and was ready with thimble scissors or thread whenever any one needed them but once when there was a pause in the conversation she and mrs marvin were both discovered to be stolen away they were seated on the bed in mary's little room with their arms around each other communing in low and gentle tones mary my dear child said her friend this event is very pleasant to me because it places you permanently near me i did not know but eventually this sweet face might lead to my losing you who are in some respects the dearest friend i have you might be sure said mary i never would have married except that my mother's happiness and the happiness of so good a friend seemed to depend on it when we renounce self in anything we have reason to hope god's blessings and so i feel assured of a peaceful life in the course i have taken you will always be as a mother to me she added laying her head on her friend's shoulder yes said mrs marvin and i must not let myself think a moment how dear it might have been to have you more my own if you feel really truly happy if you can enter on this life without any misgivings i can said mary firmly at this instant very strangely the string which confined a wreath of sea-shells around her glass having been long undermined by moths suddenly broke and fell down scattering the shells upon the floor both women started for the string of shells had been placed there by james and though neither were superstitious this was one of those odd coincidences that make hearts throb dear boy said mary gathering the shells up tenderly wherever he is i shall never cease to love him it makes me feel sad to see this come down but it is only an accident nothing of him will ever fail out of my heart mrs marvin clasped mary closer to her with tears in her eyes i'll tell you what mary it must have been the moths did that said miss prissy who had been standing unobserved at the door for a moment back moths will eat away strings just so last week mrs vernon's great family picture fell down because the moths eat through the cord people ought to use twine or cotton string always but i came to tell you that the supper's all set and the doctor out of his study and all the people are wondering where you are mary and mrs marvin gave a hasty glance at themselves in the glass to be assured of their good keeping and went into the great kitchen where a long table stood exhibiting all that plenitude of provision which the immortal description of washington irving has saved us the trouble of representing in detail the husbands brothers and lovers had come in and the scene was redolent of gaiety when mary made her appearance there was a moment's pause till she was conducted to the side of the doctor when raising his hand he invoked a grace upon the loaded board unrestrained gaieties followed groups of young men and maidens chatted together and all the gallantries of the times were enacted serious matrons commented on the cake and told each other high and particular secrets in the culinary art which they drew from remote family archives one might have learned in that instructive assembly how best to keep moths out of blankets how to make fritters of indian corn undistinguishable from oysters how to bring up babies by hand and how to mend a cracked teapot and how to take out grease from a brocade and how to reconcile absolute decrees with free will and how to make five yards of cloth answer the purpose of six and how to put down the democratic party all were busy earnest and certain just as a swarm of men and women old and young are in eighteen fifty nine miss prissy was in her glory every bow of her best cap was alive with excitement and she presented to the eyes of astonished newport gentry an animated receipt book some of the information she communicated indeed was so valuable and important that she could not trust the air with it but whispered the most important portions in a confidential tone among the crowd cerinthy ann's theological admirer was observed in deeply reflective attitude 
and that high-spirited young lady added further to his convictions of the total depravity of the species by vexing and discomposing him in those thousand ways in which a lively ill-conditioned young woman will put to rout a serious well-disposed young man comforting herself with the reflection that by and by she would repent of all her sins in a lump together vain transitory splendours even this evening so glorious so heart-cheering so fruitful in instruction and amusement could not last for ever gradually the company broke up the matrons mounted soberly on horseback behind their spouses and srinthes consoled her clerical friend by giving him an opportunity to read her a lecture on the way home if he found the courage to do so mr and mrs marvin and candace wound their way soberly homeward the doctor returned to his study for nightly devotions and before long sleep settled down on the brown cottage i'll tell you what cato said candace before composing herself to sleep i can't feel it in my bones that dis year wedding is going to come off yet end of section thirty five section thirty six of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter thirty one a day or two after madame de frontignac and mary went out to gather shells and seaweed on the beach it was four o'clock and the afternoon sun was hanging in the sultry sky of july with a hot and vaporous stillness the whole air was full of blue haze that softened the outlines of objects without hiding them the sea lay like so much glass every ship and boat was double every line and rope and spar had its counterpart and it seemed hard to say which was the most real the under or the upper world madame de frontignac and mary had brought along a little basket which they were filling with shells and sea mosses the former was in high spirits she ran and shouted and exclaimed and wondered at each new marvel thrown out upon the shore with the abandon of a little child mary could not but wonder whether this indeed were she whose strong words had pierced and wrung her sympathies the other night and whether a deep life wound could lie bleeding under those brilliant eyes and that infantine exuberance of gaiety yet surely all that which seemed so strong so true so real could not be gone so soon and it could not be so soon consoled mary wondered at her as the anglo-saxon constitution with its strong firm intensity its singleness of nature wonders at the mobile many-sided existence of warmer races whose versatility of emotion on the surface is not incompatible with the most intense sameness lower down mary's was one of those indulgent and tolerant natures which seem to form the most favourable base for the play of other minds rather than to be itself salient and something about her tender calmness always seemed to provoke the spirit of frolic in her friend she would laugh at her kiss her gambol round her dress her hair with fantastic coiffures and call her all sorts of fanciful and poetic names in french or english while mary surveyed her with a pleased and innocent surprise as a revelation of character altogether new and different from anything to which she had been hitherto accustomed she was to her a living pantomime and brought into her unembellished life the charms of opera and theatre and romance after wearying themselves with their researches they climbed round a point of rock that stretched some way out into the sea and attained to a little kind of grotto where the high cliffs shut out the rays of the sun they sat down to rest upon the rocks a fresh breeze of declining day was springing up and bringing the rising tide landward 
each several line of waves with their white crest coming up and breaking gracefully on the hard sparkling sand beach at their feet mary's eyes fixed themselves as they were apt to do in a mournful reverie on the infinite expanse of waters which was now broken and chopped into thousand incoming waves by the fresh afternoon breeze madame de frontignac noticed the expression and began to play with her as if she had been a child she pulled the comb from her hair and let down its long silky waves upon her shoulders now said she let us make a miranda of thee this is our cave i will be prince ferdinand burr told me all about that he reads beautifully and explained it all to me what a lovely story that is you must be so happy who know how to read shakespeare without learning tenez i will put this shell on your forehead it has a hole here and i will pass this gold chain through now what a pity this seaweed will not be pretty out of water it has no effect but there is some green that will do let me fasten it so now fair miranda look at thyself where is the girl so angelic as not to feel a slight curiosity to know how she shall look in a new and strange costume mary bent over the rock where a little pool of water lay in a brown hollow above the fluctuations of the tide dark and still like a mirror and saw a fair face with a white shell above the forehead and drooping wreaths of green seaweed in the silken hair and a faint blush and smile rose on the cheek giving the last finish to the picture how do you find yourself said madame confess now that i have a true talent in coiffure now i will be ferdinand she turned quickly and her eye was caught by something that mary did not see she only saw the smile fade suddenly from madame de frontignac's cheek and her lips grow deadly white while her heart beat so that mary could notice its flutterings under her black silk bodice will the sea nymphs punish the rash presumption of a mortal who intrudes said colonel burr stepping before them with a grace as invincible and assured as if he had never had any past history with either mary started with a guilty blush like a child detected in an unseemly frolic and put her hand to her head to take off the unwanted adornments let me protest in the name of the graces said burr who by that time stood with easy calmness at her side and as he spoke he stayed her hand with that gentle air of authority which made it the natural impulse of most people to obey him it would be treason against the picturesque he added to spoil that toilet so charmingly uniting the wearer to the scene mary was taken by surprise and discomposed as every one is who finds one's self masquerading in attire foreign to their usual habits and character and therefore when she would persist in taking it to pieces burr found sufficient to alleviate the embarrassment of madame de frontignac's utter silence in a playful run of protestations and compliments i think mary said madame de frontignac that we had better be returning to the house this was said in the haughtiest and coolest tone imaginable looking at the place where burr stood as if there were nothing there but empty air mary rose to go madame de frontignac offered her arm permit me to remark ladies said burr with the quiet suavity which never forsook him that your very agreeable occupations have caused time to pass more rapidly than you are aware i think you will find that the tide has risen so as to intercept the path by which you came here you will hardly be able to get around the point of rocks without some assistance mary looked a few paces ahead and saw a little before them a fresh afternoon breeze driving the rising tide high on to the side of the rocks at whose foot their course had lain 
the nook in which they had been sporting formed a part of a shelving ledge which inclined over their heads and which it was just barely possible could be climbed by a strong and agile person but which would be wholly inaccessible to a frail unaided woman there is no time to be lost said burr coolly measuring the possibilities with that keen eye that was never discomposed by any exigency i am at your service ladies i can either carry you in my arms around this point or assist you up these rocks he paused and waited for their answer madame de frontignac stood pale cold and silent hearing only the wild beating of her heart i think said mary that we should try the rocks very well said burr and placing his gloved hand on a fragment of rock somewhat above their heads he swung himself on to it with an easy agility from this he stretched himself down as far as possible towards them and extending his hand directed mary who stood foremost to set her foot on a slight projection and give him both her hands she did so and he seemed to draw her up as easily as if she had been a feather he placed her by him on a shelf of rock and turned again to madame de frontignac she folded her arms and turned resolutely away towards the sea just at that moment a coming wave broke at her feet there is no time to be lost said burr there's a tremendous wave coming in and the next wave may carry you out tant mieux she responded without turning her head oh virginie virginie exclaimed mary kneeling and stretching her arms over the rock but another voice called virginie in a tone which went to her heart she turned and saw those dark eyes full of tears oh come he said with that voice which she could never resist she put her cold trembling hands into his and he drew her up and placed her safely beside mary a few moments of difficult climbing followed in which his arm was thrown now around one and then around the other and they felt themselves carried with a force as if the slight and graceful form were strung with steel placed in safety on the top of the bank there was a natural gush of grateful feeling towards their deliverer the severest resentment the coolest moral disapprobation are necessarily somewhat softened when the object of them has just laid one under a personal obligation burr did not seem disposed to press his advantage and treated the incident as the most matter-of-course affair in the world he offered an arm to each lady with the air of a well-bred gentleman who offers a necessary support and each took it because neither wished under the circumstances to refuse he walked along leisurely homeward talking in that easy quiet natural way in which he excelled addressing no very particular remark to either one and at the door of the cottage took his leave saying as he bowed that he hoped neither of them would feel any inconvenience from their exertions and that he should do himself the pleasure to call soon and inquire after their health madame de frontignac made no reply but curtsied with a stately grace turned and went into her little room whither mary after a few minutes followed her she found her thrown upon the bed her face buried in the pillow her breast heaving as if she were sobbing but when at mary's entrance she raised her head her eyes were bright and dry it is just as i told you mary that man holds me i love him yet in spite of myself it is in vain to be angry what is the use of striking your right hand with your left when we love one more than ourselves we only hurt ourselves with our anger but said mary love is founded on respect and esteem and when that is gone why then said madame we are very sorry but we love yet do we stop loving ourselves when we have lost our own self-respect no it is so disagreeable to see we shut our eyes and ask to have the bandage put on you know that poor little heart you can think how it would have been with you if you had found that he was not what you thought 
the word struck home to mary's consciousness but she sat down and took her friend in her arms with an air self-controlled serious rational i see and feel it all dear virginie but i must stand firm for you you are in the waves and i on the shore if you are so weak at heart you must not see this man any more but he will call i will see him for you what will you tell him my heart tell him that i am ill perhaps no i will tell him the truth that you do not wish to see him that is hard he will wonder i think not said mary resolutely and furthermore i shall say to him that while madame de frontignac is at the cottage it will not be agreeable for us to receive calls from him mary ma chere you astonish me my dear friend said mary it is the only way this man this cruel wicked deceitful man must not be allowed to trifle with you in this way i will protect you and she rose up with flashing eye and glowing cheek looking as her father looked when he protested against the slave trade thou art my saint catherine said virginie rising up excited by mary's enthusiasm and hast the sword as well as the palm but dear saint don't think so very very badly of him he has a noble nature he has the angel in him the greater his sin said mary he sins against light and love but i think his heart is touched i think he is sorry oh mary if you had only seen how he looked at me when he put out his hands on the rocks there were tears in his eyes well there might be said mary i do not think he is quite a fiend no one could look at those cheeks dear virginie and not feel sad that saw you a few months ago am i so changed she said rising and looking at herself in the mirror sure enough my neck used to be quite round now you can see those two little bones like rocks at low tide poor virginie her summer is gone and the leaves are falling poor little cat and virginie stroked her own chestnut head as if she had been pitying another and began humming a little norman air with a refrain that sounded like the murmur of a brook over the stones the more mary was touched by these little poetic ways which ran just on an even line between the gay and the pathetic the more indignant she grew with the man that had brought all this sorrow she felt a saintly vindictiveness and a determination to place herself as an adamantine shield between him and her friend there is no courage and no anger like that of a gentle woman when once fully roused if ever you have occasion to meet it you will certainly remember the hour End of section 36。section 37 of the minister's wooing。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe。chapter 32 mary revolved the affairs of her friend in her mind during the night the intensity of the mental crisis through which she herself had just passed had developed in her many inward respects so that she looked upon life no longer as a timid girl but as a strong experienced woman she had thought and suffered and held converse with eternal realities until thousands of mere earthly hesitations and timidities that often restrain a young and untried nature had entirely lost their hold upon her besides mary had at heart the puritan seed of heroism never absent from the souls of true new england women her essentially hebrew education trained in daily converse with the words of prophets and seers and with the modes of thought of a grave and heroic people predisposed her to a kind of exultation which in times of great trial might rise to the heights of the religious sublime in which the impulse of self-devotion and protection took a form essentially commanding the very intensity of the repression under which her faculties developed seemed as it were to produce a surplus of hidden strength 
which came out in exigencies. Her reading, though restricted to few volumes, had been of the kind that vitalized and stimulated a poetic nature, and laid up in its chambers vigorous words and trenchant phrases for the use of an excited feeling, so that eloquence came to her as a native gift. She realized, in short, in her higher hours, the last touch with which Milton finishes his portrait of an ideal woman. Greatness of mind and nobleness their seat, build in her loftiest, and create an awe about her as a guard angelic placed. The next morning Colonel Burr called at the cottage. Mary was spinning in the garret, and Madame de Frontenac was reeling yarn, when Mrs. Scudder brought this announcement. Mother, said Mary, I wish to see Mr. Burr alone. Madame de Frontenac will not go down. Mrs. Scudder looked surprised, but asked no questions. When she was gone down, Mary stood a moment reflecting. Madame de Frontenac looked eager and agitated. Remember and notice all he says, and just how he looks, Mary, so as to tell me, and be sure and say that I thank him for his kindness yesterday. We must own he appeared very well there, did he not? Certainly, said Mary, but no man could have done less. Ah, but Mary, not every man could have done it as he did. Now don't be too hard on him, Mary. I have said dreadful things to him. I am afraid I have been too severe. After all, these distinguished men are so tempted. We don't know how much they are tempted. And who can wonder that they are a little spoiled? So, my angel, you must be merciful. Merciful, said Mary, kissing the pale cheek and feeling the cold little hands that trembled in hers. So you will go down in your little spinning toilette, mummy. I fancy you look as Joan of Arc did when she was keeping her sheep at Doremi. Go, and God bless thee and Madame de Fradenac pushed her playfully forward. Mary entered the room where Burr was seated, and wished him good morning in a serious and placid manner, in which there was not the slightest trace of embarrassment or discomposure. "'Shall I have the pleasure of seeing your fair companion this morning?' said Burr, after some moments of indifferent conversation. "'No, sir. Madame de Fradenac desires me to excuse her to you.' "'Is she ill?' said Burr, with a look of concern. "'No, Mr. Burr, she prefers not to see you.' Burr gave a start of well-bred surprise, and Mary added, "'Madame de Fratinac has made me familiar with the history of your acquaintance with her, and you will therefore understand what I mean, Mr. Burr, when I say that during the time of her stay with us we would prefer not to receive calls from you. Your language, Miss Scudder, has certainly the merit of explicitness.' "'I intend it shall have, sir,' said Mary tranquilly. "'Half the misery of the world comes of want of courage to speak and to hear the truth plainly, and in a spirit of love. "'I am gratified that you insert the last clause, Miss Scudder. "'I might not otherwise recognize the gentle being whom I have always regarded "'as the impersonation of all that is softest in woman. "'I have not the honor of understanding in the least the reason of this apparently capricious sentence,' but I bow to it in submission. Mr. Burr, said Mary, walking up to him, and looking him full in the eyes with an energy that for the moment bore down his practiced air of easy superiority, I wish to speak to you for a moment as one immortal soul should to another, without any of those false glosses and deceits which men call ceremony and good manners. You have done a very great injury to a lovely lady, whose weakness ought to have been sacred in your eyes, precisely because you are what you are, strong, keen, penetrating, able to control and govern all who come near you, because you have the power to make yourself agreeable, interesting, fascinating, and to win esteem and love. Just for that reason, you ought to hold yourself the guardian of every woman and treat her as you would wish any man to treat your own daughter. I leave it to your own conscience whether this is the manner in which you have treated Madame de Fratinac. Upon my word, Miss Scudder, began Burr, I cannot imagine what representations our mutual friend may have been making. I assure you, our intercourse has been as irreproachable as the most scrupulous could desire. Irreproachable? Innocent? 
Mr. Burr, you know that you have taken the very life out of her. You men can have everything, ambition, wealth, power. A thousand ways are open to you, and women have nothing but their hearts. And when that is gone, all is gone. Mr. Burr, you remember the rich man that had flocks and herds, but nothing would do for him but he must have the one little ewe lamb which was all his poor neighbor had. Thou art the man. You have stolen all the love she has to give, all that she had to make a happy home, and you can never give her anything in return without endangering her purity and her soul, and you knew you could not. I know you men think this is a light matter, but it is death to us. What will this woman's life be? One long struggle to forget, and when you have forgotten her, and are going on gay and happy, when you have thrown her very name away as a faded flower, she will be praying, hoping, fearing for you, though all men deny you, yet will not she. Yes, Mr. Burr, if ever your popularity and prosperity should leave you, and those who now flatter should despise and curse you, she will always be interceding with her own heart and with God for you, and making a thousand excuses when she cannot deny, and if you die, as I fear you have lived, unreconciled to the God of your fathers, it will be in her heart to offer up her very soul for you, and to pray that God will impute all your sins to her, and give you heaven. Oh, I know this, because I have felt it in my own heart, and Mary threw herself passionately down into a chair, and broke into an agony of uncontrolled sobbing. Burr turned away and stood looking through the window. Tears were dropping silently, unchecked by the cold, hard pride which was the evil demon of his life. It is due to our human nature to believe that no man could ever have been so passionately and enduringly loved and revered by both men and women as he was, without a beautiful and lovable nature. No man ever demonstrated more forcibly the truth, that it is not a man's natural constitution, but the use he makes of it which stamps him as good or evil. The diviner part of him was weeping, and the cold, proud demon was struggling to regain his lost ascendancy. Every sob of the fair, inspired child who had been speaking to him seemed to shake his heart. He felt as if he could have fallen on his knees to her, and yet that stoical habit, which was the boast of his life, which was the highest wisdom he taught to his only and beautiful daughter, was slowly stealing back round his heart, and he pressed his lips together, resolved that no word should escape till he had fully mastered himself. In a few moments Mary rose with renewed calmness and dignity, and approaching him said, Before I wish you a good morning, Mr. Burr, I must ask pardon for the liberty I have taken in speaking so very plainly. There is no pardon needed, my dear child, said Burr, turning and speaking very gently, and with a face expressive of a softened concern. If you have told me harsh truths, it was with gentle intentions. I only hope that I may prove, at least by the future, that I am not altogether so bad as you imagine. As to the friend whose name has been passed between us, no man can go beyond me in a sense of her real nobleness. I am sensible how little I can ever deserve the sentiment with which she honors me. I am ready, in my future course, to obey any commands that you and she may think proper to lay upon me. The only kindness you can now do her, said Mary, is to leave her. It is impossible that you can be merely friends. It is impossible without violating the holiest bonds that you can be more. The injury done is irreparable, but you can avoid adding another and greater one to it. Burr looked thoughtful. May I say one thing more, said Mary, the color rising in her cheeks. Burr looked at her with that smile that always drew out the confidence of every heart. Mr. Burr, she said, you will pardon me, but I cannot help saying this. You have, I am told, wholly renounced the Christian faith of your fathers, and build your whole life on quite another foundation. I cannot help feeling that this is a great and terrible mistake. I cannot help wishing that you would examine and reconsider. My dear child, I am extremely grateful to you for your remark, and appreciate fully the purity of the source from which it springs. Unfortunately, our intellectual beliefs are not subject to the control of our will. 
I have examined, and the examination has, I regret to say, not had the effect you would desire. Mary looked at him wistfully. He smiled and bowed, all himself again, and stopping at the door, he said with a proud humility, Do me the favor to present my devoted regard to your friend. Believe me, that hereafter you shall have less reason to complain of me. He bowed and was gone. An eyewitness of the scene has related that when Burr resigned his seat as president of his country's senate, he was an object of peculiar political bitterness and obloquy. Almost all who listened to him had made up their minds that he was an utterly faithless, unprincipled man, and yet such was his singular and peculiar personal power that his short farewell address melted the whole assembly into tears, and his most embittered adversaries were charmed into a momentary enthusiasm of admiration. It must not be wondered at, therefore, if our simple-hearted, loving Mary strangely found all her indignation against him gone, and herself little disposed to criticize the impassioned tenderness with which Madame de Frotenac still regarded him. We have one thing more that we cannot avoid saying of two men so singularly in juxtaposition as Aaron Burr and Dr. Hopkins. Both had a perfect logic of life and guided themselves with an inflexible rigidity by it. Burr assumed individual pleasure to be the great object of human existence, and Dr. Hopkins placed it in a life altogether beyond self. Burr rejected all sacrifice. Hopkins considered sacrifice as the foundation of all existence. To live as far as possible without a disagreeable sensation was an object which Burr proposed to himself as the summum bonum, for which he drilled down and subjugated a nature of singular richness. Hopkins, on the other hand, smoothed the asperities of a temperament naturally violent and fiery by a rigid discipline, which guided it entirely above the plane of self-indulgence. And in the pursuance of their great end, the one watched against his better nature as the other did against his worse. It is but fair, then, to take their lives as the practical workings of their respective ethical creeds. End of section 37. Recording by Kathy Reynolds, Albany, New York. Section 38 of The Minister's Wooing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Minister's Wooing by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter 33. Enfant, cher Sibylle, said Madame de Frontenac, when Mary came out of the room with her cheeks glowing and her eyes flashing with a still, unsubdued light. Te voilà encore. What did he say, mamie? Did he ask for me? Yes, said Mary. He asked for you. What did you tell him? I told him that you wished me to excuse you. How did he look then? Did he look surprised? A good deal so, I thought, said Mary. Allons, mamie, tell me all you said and all he said. Oh, said Mary, I am the worst person in the world. In fact, I cannot remember anything that I have said, but I told him that he must leave you and never see you any more. Oh, mamie, never! Madame de Frontenac sat down on the side of the bed with such a look of utter despair as went to Mary's heart. You know that that is best, Virginie, do you not? Oh, yes, I know it, but it is like death to me. Ah, well, what shall Virginie do now? You have your husband, said Mary. I do not love him, said Madame de Frontenac. Yes, but he is a good and honorable man, and you should love him. Love is not in our power, said Madame de Frontenac. Not every kind of love, said Mary, but some kinds. If you have an indulgent friend who protects you and cares for you, you can be grateful to him. You can try to make him happy, and in time you may come to love him very much. He is a thousand times nobler man, if what you say is true, than the one who has injured you so. Oh, Mary, said Madame de Frotenac, there are some cases where we find it too easy to love our enemies. More than that, said Mary. I believe that if you were to go on patiently in the way of duty and pray daily to God, that at last he will take out of your heart this painful love and give you a true and healthy one. As you say, such feelings are very sweet and noble, but they are not the only ones we have to live by. 
we can find happiness in duty in self-sacrifice in calm sincere honest friendship that is what you can feel for your husband your words cool me said madame de frontenac thou art a sweet snow maiden and my heart is hot and tired i like to feel thee in my arms she said putting her arms around mary and resting her head upon her shoulder talk to me so every day and read me good cool verses out of that beautiful book and perhaps by and by i shall grow still and quiet like you thus mary soothed her friend but every few days this soothing had to be done over as long as burr remained in newport when he was finally gone she grew more calm the simple homely ways of the cottage the healthful routine of daily domestic toils into which she delighted to enter brought refreshment to her spirits that fine tact and exquisite social sympathy which distinguishes the french above other nations caused her at once to enter into the spirit of the life in which she moved so that she no longer shocked any one's religious feelings by acts forbidden to the puritan idea of the sabbath or failed in any of the exterior proprieties of religious life she also read and studied with avidity the english bible which came to her with the novelty of a wholly new book and in a new language nor was she without a certain artistic valuation of the austere precision and gravity of the religious life by which she was surrounded it is sublime but a little glacial like the alps she sometimes said to mary and mrs marvin when speaking of it but then she added playfully there are the flowers les roses des alpes and the air is very strengthening and it is near to heaven il faut avouer we have shown how she appeared to the eye of new england life it may not be uninteresting to give a letter to one of her friends which showed how the same appeared to her it was not a friend with whom she felt on such terms that her intimacy with burr would furnish any allusions to her correspondence you behold me my charming gabrielle quite pastoral recruiting from the dissipations of my philadelphia life in a lovely quiet cottage with most worthy excellent people whom i have learnt to love very much they are good and true as pious as the saints themselves although they do not belong to the true church a thing which i am sorry for but then let us hope that if the world is wide heaven is wider and that all worthy and religious people will find room at last this is virginie's own little pet private heresy and when i tell it to the abbe he only smiles and so i think somehow that it is not so very bad as it might be we have had a very gay life in philadelphia and now i am growing tired of the world and think i shall retire to my cheese like la fontaine's rat these people in the country here in america have a character quite their own very different from the life of cities where one sees for the most part only a continuation of the forms of good society which exist in the old world in the country these people seem simple grave severe always industrious cold and reserved in their manners towards each other but with great warmth of heart they are all obedient to the word of their priest whom they call a minister and who lives among them just like any other man and marries and has children everything in their worship is plain and austere their churches are perfectly desolate they have no chants no pictures no carvings only a most disconsolate bare building where they meet together and sing one or two hymns and the minister makes one or two prayers all out of his own thoughts and then gives them a long long discourse about things which i cannot understand english enough to comprehend there is a very beautiful charming young girl here the daughter of my hostess who is as lovely and as saintly as saint catherine and has such a genius for religion that if she had been in our church she would certainly have made a saint her mother is a respectable and worthy matron and the good priest lives in the family i think he is a man of very sublime religion as much above this world as a great mountain but he has the true sense of liberty and fraternity for he has dared to oppose with all his might this detestable and cruel trade in poor negroes which makes us who are so proud of the example of america in asserting the rights of man so ashamed of her inconsistencies well now there is a little romance getting up in the cottage for the good priest has fixed his eyes on the pretty saint and has discovered what he must be blind not to see that she is very lovely and so as he can marry he wants to make her his wife 
and her mamma, who adores him as if he were God, is quite set upon it. The sweet Marie, however, has had a lover of her own in her little heart, a beautiful young man who went to sea, as heroes always do, to seek his fortune. And the cruel sea has drowned him, and the poor little saint has wept and prayed her very life out on his grave, till she is so thin and sweet and mournful that it makes one's heart ache to see her smile. In our church, Gabrielle, she would have gone into a convent, but she makes a vocation of her daily life, and goes round the house so sweetly, doing all the little work that is to be done, as sacredly as the nuns pray at the altar. For you must know, here in New England, the people for the most part keep no servants, but perform all the household work themselves, with no end of spinning and sewing besides. It is the true Arcadia, where you find refined and cultivated natures busying themselves with the simplest toils. For these people are well-read and well-bred, and truly ladies in all things. And so, my little Marie and I, we feed the hens and chickens together, and we search for eggs in the hay in the barn, and they have taught me to spin at their great wheel, and a little one, too, which makes a noise like the humming of a bee. But where am I? Oh, I was telling about the romance. Well, so the good priest has proposed for my Marie, and the dear soul has accepted him, as the nun accepts the veil, for she only loves him filially and religiously, and now they are going on in their way with preparations for the wedding. They had what they call a quilting here the other night, to prepare the bride's quilt, and all the friends in the neighborhood came. It was very amusing to see. The morals of this people are so austere that young men and girls are allowed the greatest freedom. They associate and talk freely together, and the young men walk home alone with the girls after evening parties. And most generally the young people, I am told, arrange their marriages among themselves before the consent of the parents is asked. This is very strange to us. I must not weary you, however, with the details. I watch my little romance daily, and will let you hear further as it progresses. With a thousand kisses, I am ever your loving Virginie. End of section 38. Recording by Kathy Reynolds, Albany, New York. Section 39 of The Minister's Wooing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. The Minister's Wooing by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter 34. Meanwhile, wedding proceedings were going on at the cottage with that consistent vigor with which yankee people always drive operations when they know precisely what they are about the wedding day was definitively fixed for the first of august and every one of the two weeks between had its particular significance and value precisely marked out and arranged in mrs katie scudder's comprehensive and systematic schemes it was settled that the newly wedded pair were for a while at least to reside at the cottage it might have been imagined therefore that no great external changes were in contemplation but it is astonishing to see the amount of grave discussion the amount of consulting advising and running abstractedly to and fro which can be made to result out of an apparently slight change in the relative position of two people in the same house dr hopkins really opened his eyes with calm amazement good modest soul he had never imagined himself the hero of so much preparation he heard his name constantly from morning to night occurring in busy consultations that seemed to be going on between miss prissy and mrs deacon twitchell and mrs scudder and mrs jones and quietly wondered what they could have so much more than usual to say about him for a while it seemed to him that the whole house was about to be torn to pieces he was even requested to step out of his study one day into which immediately entered in his absence two of the most vigorous women of the parish who proceeded to uttermost measures first pitching everything into pie so that the doctor who returned disconsolately to look for a book at once gave up himself and his system of divinity as entirely lost until assured by one of the ladies in a condescending manner that he knew nothing about the matter and that if he would return after half a day he would find everything right again a declaration in which he tried to have unlimited faith 
and where he found the advantage of a mind accustomed to believe in mysteries and it is to be remarked that on his return he actually found his table in most perfect order with not a single one of his papers missing in fact to his ignorant eye the room looked exactly as it did before and when miss percy eloquently demonstrated to him that every inch of that paint had been scrubbed and the windows taken out and washed inside and out and rinsed through three waters and that the curtains had been taken down and washed and put through a blue water and starched and ironed and put up again he only innocently wondered in his ignorance what there was in a man's being married that made all these ceremonies necessary but the doctor was a wise man and in cases of difficulty kept his mind much to himself and therefore he only informed these energetic practitioners that he was extremely obliged to them accepting the matter by simple faith an example which we recommend to all good men in similar circumstances the house throughout was subjected to similar renovations everything in every chest or trunk or box was vigorously pulled out and hung out on lines in the clothes-yard to air for when once the spirit of enterprise has fairly possessed a group of women it assumes the form of a prophetic fury and carries them beyond themselves let not any ignorant mortal of the masculine gender at such hours rashly dare to question the promptings of the genius that inspires them spite of all the treatises that have lately appeared to demonstrate that there is no particular inherent diversity between men and women we hold to the opinion that one thorough season of house cleansing is sufficient to demonstrate the existence of awful and mysterious differences between the sexes and of subtle and reserved forces in the female line before which the lords of creation can only veil their faces with a discreet reverence as our doctor has done in fact his whole deportment on the occasion was characterized by humility so edifying as really to touch the hearts of the whole synod of matrons and miss prissy rewarded him by declaring impressively her opinion that he was worthy to have a voice in the choosing the wedding dress and she actually swooped him up just in a very critical part of a distinction between natural and moral ability and conveyed him bodily as fairy sprites know how to convey the most ponderous of mortals into the best room where three specimens of brocade lay spread out upon a table for inspection mary stood by the side of the table her pretty head bent reflectively downward her cheek just resting upon the tip of one of her fingers as she stood looking thoughtfully through the brocades at something deeper that seemed to lie under them and when the doctor was required to give judgment on the articles it was observed by the matrons that his large blue eyes were resting upon mary with an expression that almost glorified his face and it was not until his elbow was repeatedly shaken by miss prissy that he gave a sudden start and fixed his attention as was requested upon the silks it had been one of miss prissy's favorite theories that that dear blessed man had taste enough if he would only give his mind to things and in fact the doctor rather verified the remark on the present occasion for he looked very conscientiously and soberly at the silks and even handled them cautiously and respectfully with his fingers and listened with grave attention to all that miss prissy told him of their price and properties and then laid his finger down on one whose snow-white ground was embellished with a pattern representing lilies of the valley on a background of green leaves this is the one he said with an air of decision and then he looked at mary and smiled and a murmur of universal approbation broke out a chorus of loud acclamations in which miss prissy's voice took the lead conveyed to the innocent-minded doctor the idea that in some mysterious way he had distinguished himself in the eyes of his feminine friends whereat he retired to his study slightly marvelling but on the whole well pleased as men generally are when they do better than they expect and miss prissy turning out all profaner persons from the apartment held a solemn consultation to which only mary mrs scudder and madame de frontignac were admitted for it is to be observed that the latter had risen daily and hourly in miss prissy's esteem since her entrance into the cottage and she declared that if she only would give her a few hints 
she didn't believe but that she could make that dress look just like a paris one and rather intimated that in such a case she might almost be ready to resign all mortal ambitions the afternoon of this day just at that cool hour when the clock ticks so quietly in a new england kitchen and everything is so clean and put away that there seems to be nothing to do in the house mary sat quietly down in her room to hem a ruffle everybody had gone out of the house on various errands the doctor with implicit faith had surrendered himself to mrs scudder and miss prissy to be conveyed up to newport and attend to various appointments in relation to his outer man which he was informed would be indispensable in the forthcoming solemnities madame de frontignac had also gone to spend the day with some of her newport friends and mary quite well pleased with the placid and orderly stillness which reigned through the house sat pleasantly murmuring a little tune to her sewing when suddenly the trip of a merry brisk foot was heard in the kitchen and miss cerinthy ann twitchell made her appearance at the door her healthy glowing cheek wearing a still brighter colour from the exercise of a three-mile walk in a july day why cerinthy said mary how glad i am to see you well i have been meaning to come down all this week but there is so much to do in the haying time but to-day i told mother i must come i brought these down she said unfolding a dozen of snowy damask napkins that i spun myself and was thinking of you almost all the while i spun them so i suppose they ain't quite so wicked as they might be we will remark here that cerinthy ann in virtue of having a high stock of animal spirits and a great fullness of physical vigour had very small proclivities toward the unseen and spiritual but still always indulged a secret resentment at being classed as a sinner above many others who as church members made such professions and were as she remarked not a bit better than she was she always however had cherished an unbounded veneration for mary and had made her the confidant of most of her important secrets and it soon became very evident that she had come with one on her mind now don't you want to come and sit out in the lot she said to her after sitting a while twirling her bonnet strings with the air of someone who has something to say and does not know exactly how to begin upon it mary cheerfully gathered up her thread scissors and ruffling and the two stepped over the window-sill and soon found themselves seated cosily under the boughs of a large apple tree whose descending branches meeting the tops of the high grass all around formed a perfect seclusion as private as heart could desire they sat down pushing away a place in the grass and cerinthy ann took off her bonnet and threw it among the clover exhibiting to view her glossy black hair always trimly arranged in shining braids except where some curls fell over the rich high colour of her cheeks something appeared to discompose her this afternoon there were those evident signs of a consultation impending which to an experienced eye are as unmistakable as the coming up of a shower in summer cerinthy began by passionately demolishing several heads of clover remarking as she did so that she didn't see for her part how mary could keep so calm when things were coming so near and as mary answered to this only with a quiet smile she broke out again i don't see for my part how a young girl could marry a minister anyhow but then i think you are just cut out for it but what would anybody say if i should do such a thing i don't know said mary innocently well i suppose everybody would hold up their hands and yet if i do say it myself she added colouring there are not many girls who could make a better minister's wife than i could if i had a mind to try that i am sure of said mary warmly i guess you are the only one that ever thought so said cerinthy giving an impatient toss there's father all the while mourning over me and mother too and yet i don't see but that i do pretty much all that is done in the house and they say i am a great comfort in a temporal point of view but oh the groanings and the sighs that there are over me i don't think it is pleasant to think that your best friends are thinking such awful things about you when you are working your fingers off to help them it is kind of discouraging but i don't know what to do about it and for a few moments cerinthy sat demolishing buttercups and throwing them up in the air till her shiny black head was covered with golden flakes 
while her cheek grew redder with something that she was going to say next now mary there is that creature well you know he won't take no for an answer what shall i do suppose then you try yes said mary rather archly oh pshaw mary scudder you know better than that now i look like it don't i why yes said mary looking at cerinthy deliberately on the whole i think you do well one thing i must say said cerinthy i can't see what he finds in me i think he is a thousand times too good for me why you have no idea mary how i have plagued him i believe that man really is a christian she added while something like a penitent tear actually glistened in those sharp saucy black eyes besides she added i have told him everything i could think of to discourage him i told him i had a bad temper and didn't believe the doctrines and couldn't promise that i ever should and after all that creature keeps right on and i don't know what to tell him well said mary mildly do you think you really love him love him said cerinthy giving a great flounce to be sure i don't catch me loving any man i told him last night i didn't but it didn't do a bit of good i used to think that man was bashful but i declare i have altered my mind he will talk and talk till i don't know what to do i tell you mary he talks beautifully too sometimes here cerinthy turned quickly away and began reaching passionately after clover heads after a few moments she resumed the fact is mary that man needs somebody to take care of him for he never thinks of himself they say he has got the consumption but he hasn't any more than i have it is just the way he neglects himself preaching talking visiting nobody to take care of him and see to his clothes and nurse him up when he gets a little hoarse and run down well i suppose if i am unregenerate i do know how to keep things in order and if i should keep such a man's soul in his body i suppose i should be doing some good in the world because if a minister don't live of course he can't convert anybody just think of his saying that i could be a comfort to him i told him it was perfectly ridiculous and besides says i what will everybody think i thought that i had really talked him out of the notion of it last night but there he was again this morning and told me he had derived a great encouragement from what i said well the poor man really is lonesome his mother's dead and he hasn't any sisters i asked him why he didn't go and take miss alladine's locum everybody says she would make a first-rate minister's wife well and what did he say to that said mary well something really silly about my looks said cerinthy looking down mary looked up and remarked the shining black hair the long dark lashes lying down over a glowing cheek where two arch dimples were nestling and said quietly probably he is a man of taste cerinthy i advise you to leave the matter entirely to his judgment you don't really marry said the damsel looking up don't you think it would injure him if i should i think not materially said mary well said cerinthy rising the men will be coming home from mowing before i get home and want their supper mother has one of her headaches on this afternoon so i can't stop any longer there isn't a soul in the house knows where anything is when i am gone if i should ever take it into my head to go off i don't know what would become of father and mother i was telling mother the other day that i thought unregenerate folks were of some use in this world anyway does your mother know anything about it said mary oh as to mother i believe she has been hoping and praying about it these three months she thinks that i am such a desperate case it is the only way i am to be brought in as she calls it that's what set me against him at first but the fact is if girls will let a man argue with them he always contrives to get the best of it i am provoked about it too but dear me he is so meek there it is no use of getting provoked at him well i guess i will go home and think about it as she turned to go she looked really pretty her long lashes were wet with a twinkling moisture like meadow grass after a shower and there was a softened childlike expression stealing over the careless gaiety of her face mary put her arms round her with a gentle caressing movement which the other returned with a hearty embrace they stood locked in each other's arms the bright vigorous strong-hearted girl with that pale spiritual face resting on her breast as when the morning songful and radiant 
clasps the pale silver moon to her glowing bosom look here now mary said sir Inthy. your folks are all gone you may as well walk with me it's pleasant now yes i will said mary wait a moment till i get my bonnet in a few moments the two girls were walking together in one of those little pasture foot tracks which run cosily among huckleberry and juniper bushes while Sorinthy eagerly pursued the subject she could not leave thinking of their path now wound over high ground that overlooked the distant sea now lost itself in little copses of cedar and pitch pine and now there came on the air the pleasant breath of new hay which mowers were harvesting in adjoining meadows they walked on and on as girls will because when a young lady has once fairly launched on the enterprise of telling another all that he said and just how he looked for the last three months walks are apt to be indefinitely extended mary was besides one of the most seductive little confidants in the world she was so pure from all selfism so heartily and innocently interested in what another was telling her that people in talking with her found the subject constantly increasing in interest although if they had really been called upon afterward to state the exact portion in words which she added to the conversation they would have been surprised to find it so small in fact before Sorinthy ann had quite finished her confessions they were more than a mile from the cottage and mary began to think of returning saying that her mother would wonder where she was when she came home End of section 39section forty of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by eva davis the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter thirty five the sun was just setting and the whole air and sea seemed flooded with rosy rays even the crags and rocks of the seashore took purple and lilac tints and savins and junipers had a painter been required to represent them would have been found not without a suffusion of the same tints through the tremulous rosy sea of the upper air the silver full moon looked out like some calm superior presence which waits only for the flush of a temporary excitement to die away to make its tranquillizing influence felt mary as she walked homeward with this dreamy light about her moved with a slower step than when borne along by the vigorous arm and determined motion of her young friend it is said that a musical sound uttered with decision by one instrument always makes vibrate the corresponding chord of another and mary felt as she left her positive but warm-hearted friend a plaintive vibration of something in her own self of which she was conscious her calm friendship for her future husband had no part she fell into one of those reveries which she thought she had forever forbidden to herself and there arose before her mind like a picture the idea of a marriage ceremony but the eyes of the bridegroom were dark and his curls were clustering in raven ringlets and her hand throbbed in his as it had never throbbed in any other it was just as she was coming out of a little grove of cedars where the high land overlooks the sea and the dream which came to her overcame her with a vague and yearning sense of pain suddenly she heard footsteps behind her and some one said mary it was spoken in a choked voice as one speaks in the crisis of a great emotion and she turned and saw those very eyes that very hair yes and the cold little hand throbbed with that very throb in that strong living manly hand and whether in the body or out of the body she knew not she felt herself born in those arms and words that spoke themselves in her inner heart words profaned by being repeated were on her ear oh is this a dream is it a dream james are we in heaven oh i have lived through such an agony i have been so worn out oh i thought you would never come and then the eyes closed and heaven and earth faded away together in a trance of blissful rest but it was no dream for an hour later you might have seen a manly form sitting in that self-same place bearing in his arms a pale girl whom he cherished as tenderly as a mother her babe 
and they were talking together talking in low tones and in all this wide universe neither of them knew or felt anything but the great joy of being thus side by side they spoke of love mightier than death which many waters cannot quench they spoke of yearnings each for the other of longing prayers of hopes deferred and then of this great joy for she had hardly yet returned to the visible world scarce wakened from deadly faintness she had not come back fully to the realm of life only to that of love and therefore it was that without knowing that she spoke she had said all and compressed the history of those three years into one hour but at last thoughtful for her health and provident of her weakness he rose up and passed his arm around her to convey her home and as he did so he spoke one word that broke the whole charm you will allow me mary the right of a future husband to watch over your life and health then came back the visible world recollection consciousness and the great battle of duty and mary drew away a little and said oh james you are too late that can never be he drew back from her mary are you married before god i am she said my word is pledged i cannot retract it i have suffered a good man to place his whole faith upon it a man who loves me with his whole soul but mary you do not love him that is impossible said james holding her off from him and looking at her with an agonized eagerness after what you have just said it is not possible oh james i'm sure i don't know what i have said it was all so sudden and i didn't know what i was saying but things that i must never say again the day is fixed for next week it is all the same as if you had found me his wife not quite said james his voice cutting the air with a decided manly ring i have some words to say to that yet oh james will you be selfish will you tempt me to do a mean dishonourable thing to be false to my word deliberately given but said james eagerly you know mary you never would have given it if you had known that i was living that is true james but i did give it i have suffered him to build all his hopes of life upon it i beg you not to tempt me help me to do right but mary did you not get my letter your letter yes that long letter that i wrote you i never got any letter james strange he said no wonder it seems sudden to you have you seen your mother said mary who was conscious this moment only of a dizzy instinct to turn the conversation from the spot where she felt too weak to bear it no do you suppose i should see anybody before you oh then you must go to her said mary james you don't know how she has suffered they were drawing near to the cottage gate do pray said mary go hurry to your mother don't be too sudden either for she's very weak she is almost worn out with sorrow go my dear brother dear you always will be to me james helped her into the house and they parted all the house was yet still the open kitchen door let in a sober square of moonlight on the floor the very stir of the leaves in the trees could be heard mary went into her little room and threw herself upon the bed weak weary yet happy for deeper and higher above all other feelings was the great relief that he was living still after a little while she heard the rattling of the wagon and then the quick patter of miss prissy's feet and her mother's considerate tones and the doctor's grave voice and quite unexpectedly to herself she was shocked to find herself turning with an inward shudder from the idea of meeting him how very wicked she thought how ungrateful and she prayed that god would give her strength to check the first rising of such feelings then there was her mother so ignorant and innocent busy putting away baskets of things that she had bought in provision for the wedding day mary almost felt as if she had a guilty secret but when she looked back upon the last two hours she felt no wish to take them back two little hours of joy and rest they had been so pure so perfect she thought god must have given them to her as a keepsake 
to remind her of his love and to strengthen her in the way of duty some will perhaps think it an unnatural thing that mary should have regarded her pledge to the doctor as of so absolute and binding a force but they must remember the rigidity of her education self-denial and self-sacrifice had been the daily bread of her life every prayer hymn and sermon from her childhood had warned her to distrust her inclinations and regard her feelings as traitors in particular had she been brought up within a superstitious tenacity in regard to the sacredness of a promise and in this case the promise involved so deeply the happiness of a friend whom she had loved and revered all her life that she never thought of any way to escape from it she had been taught that there was no feeling so strong but that it might be immediately repressed at the call of duty and if the idea arose to her of this great love to another as standing in her way she immediately answered it by saying how would it have been if i had been married as i could have overcome then so i can now mrs scudder came into her room with a candle in her hand and mary accustomed to read the expressions of her mother's face saw at a glance a visible discomposure there she held the light so that it shone upon mary's face are you asleep she said no mother are you unwell no mother only a little tired mrs scudder set down the candle and shut the door and after a moment's hesitation said my daughter i have some news to tell you which i want you to prepare your mind for keep yourself quite quiet oh mother said mary stretching out her hands towards her i know it james has come home how did you hear said her mother with astonishment i have seen him mother mrs scudder's countenance fell where i went to walk home with sir Vinthy twitchell and as i was coming back he came up behind me just at savin rock mrs scudder sat down on the bed and took her daughter's hand i trust my dear child she said and stopped i think i know what you are going to say mother it is a great joy and a great relief but of course i shall be true to my engagement with the doctor mrs scudder's face brightened that is my own daughter i might have known that you would do so you would not certainly so cruelly disappoint a noble man that has set his whole faith on you no mother i shall not disappoint him i told james that i should be true to my word he will probably see the justice of it said mrs scudder in that easy tone with which elderly people are apt to dispose of the feelings of young persons perhaps it may be something of a trial at first mary looked at her mother with incredulous blue eyes the idea that feelings which made her hold her breath when she thought of them could be so summarily disposed of struck her as almost an absurdity she turned her face wearily to the wall with a deep sigh and said after all mother it is mercy enough and comfort enough to think that he is living poor cousin ellen too what a relief to her it is like life from the dead oh i shall be happy enough no fear of that and you know said mrs scudder that there has never existed any engagement of any kind between you and james he had no right to found any expectations on anything you ever told him that is true also mother said mary i had never thought of such a thing as marriage in relation to james of course pursued mrs scudder he will always be to you as a near friend mary assented wearily there is but a week now before your wedding continued mrs scudder and i think cousin james if he is reasonable will see the propriety of your mind being kept as quiet as possible i heard the news this afternoon in town pursued mrs scudder from captain staunton and then by a curious coincidence i received this letter from him from james which came from new york by post the brig that brought it must have been delayed out of the harbor oh please mother give it to me said mary rising up with animation he mentioned having sent me one perhaps you had better wait till morning said mrs scudder you are tired and excited oh mother i think i shall be more composed when i know all that is in it said mary still stretching out her hand well my daughter you are the best judge said mrs scudder 
and she set down the candle on the table and left mary alone it was a very thick letter of many pages dated in canton and ran as follows end of section forty Section 41 of The Minister's Wooing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. The Minister's Wooing by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter 36. My dearest Mary, I have lived through many wonderful scenes since I saw you last my life has been so adventurous that i scarcely know myself when i think of it but it is not of that i am going now to write i have written all that to mother and she will show it to you but since i parted from you there has been another history going on within me and that is what i wish to make you understand if i can it seems to me that i have been a changed man from that afternoon when i came to your window where we parted i have never forgotten how you looked then nor what you said nothing in my life ever had such an effect on me i thought that i loved you before but i went away feeling that love was something so deep and high and sacred that i was not worthy to name it to you i cannot think of the man in the world that is worthy of what you said you felt for me from that hour there was a new purpose in my soul a purpose which has led me upward ever since i thought to myself in this way there is some secret source from whence this inner life springs and i knew that it was connected with the bible which you gave me and so i thought i would read it carefully and deliberately to see what i could make of it i began with the beginning it impressed me with a sense of something quaint and strange something rather fragmentary and yet there were spots all along that went right to the heart of a man who has to deal with life and things as i did now i must say that the doctor's preaching as i told you never impressed me much in any way i could not make any connection between it and the men i had to manage and the things i had to do in my daily life but there were things in the bible that struck me otherwise there was one passage in particular and that was where jacob started off from all his friends to go off and seek his fortune in a strange country and lay down to sleep all alone in the field with only a stone for his pillow it seemed to me exactly the image of what every young man is like when he leaves his home and goes out to shift for himself in this hard world i tell you mary that one man alone on the great ocean of life feels himself a very weak thing we are held up by each other more than we know till we go off by ourselves into this great experiment well there he was as lonesome as i upon the deck of my ship and so lying with a stone under his head he saw a ladder in his sleep between him and heaven and angels going up and down that was a sight which came to the very point of his necessities he saw that there was a way between him and god and that there were those above who did care for him and who could come to him to help him well so the next morning he got up and set up the stone to mark the place and it says jacob vowed a vow saying if god will be with me and will keep me in this way that i go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that i come again to my father's house in peace then shall the lord be my god now there was something that looked to me like a tangible foundation to begin on if i understand dr hopkins i believe he would have called that all selfishness at first sight it does look a little so but then i thought of it this way here he was all alone god was entirely invisible to him and how could he feel certain that he really existed unless he could come into some kind of connection with him the point that he wanted to be sure of was more than merely to know that there was a god who made the world he wanted to know whether he cared anything about men and would do anything to help them and so in fact it was saying if there is a god who interests himself at all in me and will be my friend and protector i will obey him so far as i can find out his will i thought to myself this is the great experiment 
and i will try it i made in my heart exactly the same resolution and just quietly resolved to assume for a while as a fact that there was such a god and whenever i came to a place where i could not help myself just to ask his help honestly in so many words and see what would come of it well as i went on reading through the old testament i was more and more convinced that all the men of those times had tried this experiment and found that it would bear them and in fact i did begin to find in my own experience a great many things happening so remarkably that i could not but think that somebody did attend even to my prayers i began to feel a trembling faith that somebody was guiding me and that the events of my life were not happening by accident but working themselves out by his will well as i went on in this way there were other and higher thoughts kept rising in my mind i wanted to be better than i was i had a sense of a life much nobler and purer than anything i had ever lived that i wanted to come up to but in the world of men as i found it such feelings are always laughed down as romantic and impracticable and impossible but about this time i began to read the new testament and then the idea came to me that the same power that helped me in the lower sphere of life would help me carry out these higher aspirations perhaps the gospels would not have interested me so much if i had begun with them first but my old testament life seemed to have schooled me and brought me to a place where i wanted something higher and i began to notice that my prayers were now more that i might be noble and patient and self-denying and constant in my duty than for any other kind of help and then i understood what met me in the very first of matthew he shall be called jesus for he shall save his people from their sins i began now to live a new life a life in which i felt myself coming into sympathy with you for mary when i began to read the gospels i took knowledge of you that you had been with jesus the crisis of my life was that dreadful night of the shipwreck it was as dreadful as the day of judgment no words of mine can describe to you what i felt when i knew that our rudder was gone and saw those hopeless rocks before us what i felt for our poor men but in the midst of it all the words came into my mind and jesus was in the hinder part of the vessel asleep on a pillow and at once i felt he was there and when the ship struck i was only conscious of an intense going out of my soul to him like peter's when he threw himself from the ship to meet him in the waters i will not recapitulate what i have already written the wonderful manner in which i was saved and in which friends and help and prosperity and worldly success came to me again after life had seemed all lost but now i am ready to return to my country and i feel as jacob did when he said with my staff i passed over this jordan but now am i become two bands i do not need any arguments now to convince me that the bible is from above there is a great deal in it that i cannot understand a great deal that seems to me inexplicable but all i can say is that i have tried its directions and find that in my case they do work that it is a book i can live by and that is enough for me and now mary i am coming home again quite another man from what i went out with a whole new world of thought and feeling in my heart and a new purpose by which please god i mean to shape my life all this under god i owe to you and if you will let me devote my whole life to you it will be a small return for what you have done for me you know i left you wholly free others must have seen your loveliness and felt your worth and you may have learned to love some better man than i but i know not what hope tells me that this will not be and i shall find true what the bible says of love that many waters cannot quench it nor floods drown in any case i shall always be from my very heart yours and yours only till death james marvin mary rose after reading this letter wrapped into a divine state of exaltation 
the pure joy in contemplating an infinite good to another in which the question of self was utterly forgotten he was then what she had always hoped and prayed he would be and she pressed the thought triumphantly to her heart he was that true and victorious man that christian able to subdue life and to show in a perfect and healthy manly nature a reflection of the image of the superhuman excellence her prayers that night were aspirations and praises and she felt how possible it might be so to appropriate the good and the joy and the nobleness of others so as to have in them an eternal and satisfying pleasure and with this came the dearer thought that she in her weakness and solitude had been permitted to put her hand to the beginning of a work so noble the consciousness of good done to an immortal spirit is wealth that neither life nor death can take away and so having prayed she lay down with that sleep which god giveth to his beloved end of section forty one